A broker is an independent middle party that will make that initial introduction. They are typically working with either a distributor or a retailer already, and they agree for a commission to introduce your product to that relationship. Whereas the distributor is very much a warehouse delivery and in the case of DSD, a merchandising operation as well. This is the e-commerce brain trust, a podcast about building momentum online for established consumer brands. Join our hosts and their expert guests for high level conversations about e-commerce strategies, trends, and innovations. Access our brain trust and boost your brand's e-commerce potential. Hello, and welcome back to another episode of the e-commerce brain trust. I'm Julie Spear, one of your co-hosts, and joining me today is Noelle Barnes. Hello, I'm excited to be here. Hi, Noelle. Good to have you back again. As we do another podcast where we take a listen to an interview that Kiri did recently, and we get to do our hot takes on the interview. I'm kind of liking this new setup here. Me too. Yeah. And this is a great one. Yeah, this is an interesting one. So in in today's episode, Kiri interviews Joel Goldstein, who is the president of Mr. Checkout Distributors. And they get into the conversation, answer the growing, I can't say age old question, but the, the question of the day is brick and mortar dying. They really dig into that. And we get to hear Joel's take on the, the rationale he has for his answer to that question. Yes. Yes. And I think our, our listeners will find that very interesting because I think his take is is a different take on this question than I've heard before. And so it, it gives me hope. It does. Yeah. His his answer was very interesting and it wasn't what I was expecting. Mm-hmm. So yeah. that's quite the tease to the episode. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, and, and Dole is a really busy guy. He's he's the author of Amazon's best-selling book, Start from Success. He is the host of Retail Summit Live, which sounds like it was an awful lot of work to get off the ground. He talks a bit about that. And the president of Mr. Checkout Distributors, LLC, just to name a few things he's working on. He's very focused on the retail sector, and he specializes on advising brands on where their product will be best received, which is really cool. And he helps them build go-to-market strategies and get their products on the right store shelves. So that real targeting and making sure that the products are getting to the right places. He's a contributor to Entrepreneur and he's a fellow contributor to both Forbes Inc. and Retail Wire. And he regularly weighs in on Fox News as a retail industry expert. And he also does consulting. So, you know, kind of an overachiever, this guy. Oh my gosh. He's doing a lot of things. (laughs) When does he sleep? Um, I know, know, right? (laughs) He, in his consulting work, he helps companies build out leadership potential within their ranks. So I'm really excited for our e-commerce brain trust listeners to hear what Joel has to say, because brick and mortar is still relevant in this growing e-commerce world. And so his take on this is pretty relevant to our listeners. Well, and needless to say, all of his experience brings a lot of weight to the information he sh- shares in this conversation. So absolutely. Yeah. All right. Well, we'll give it a pause here and play the interview that Kiri has with Joel. And then Noelle and I will be back to talk about the points that really jumped out at us from this interview. I'm really happy to have Joel Goldstein on the show. Joel is a fellow Retail Wire contributor. I believe that's how we first uh, came to know each other. Thank you for coming on the show. Thank you for having me. So on this podcast, we primarily talk about online channels. It is called e-commerce brain trust after all. So I wanted to bring Joel on to provide a different perspective, which is around selling to brick and mortar retailers. So Joel, tell us a little bit about how you came to be an expert in this space. Yeah, I'd be happy to. You know, in a lot of the clients that we work with start online or have that omni-channel presence as we discussed, you know, but the base of our business, and it's called Mr. Checkout Distributors, really stemmed from my father starting the company 30 years ago. And he started it as a platform to train distributors because he was a distributor back in the 80s. Mm. And he was working for Keebler uh, Cookies. No, they weren't paying him too much. So he started selling other products out of his trunk to the same stores that he was servicing Keebler with. And he was making more money selling products, you know, stocking shelves than he was with Keebler. So, you know, when they eventually found out he was fired and, you know, mm-hmm. he had that established route already. But um, 
that's kind of how he came into the distribution business. As a rebel. And, yeah, <laughs> you know, a little <laughs> underhanded, but good intentioned as he was. You know, he had, he had a family to support. Right. You know, so you know, when he started back in the 80s, a lot of people were getting out of their jobs. They were being fired. You know, it was a tough time for the economy. And, you know, his response to that was to train a couple of his friends, you know, compatriots, so to say, on how to start their own routes. And that was in the local area. We were in Boston at the time. And he thought about it. And he's like, you know, I bet this would resonate on a national level. And so he put an ad in uh, papers on a national level and he started training people. And we got up to about, I believe 360 distributors up to about 10 years ago. And that was, he pretty much sold out the country and all the major metropolitan areas. And from there, we really pivoted our arm into finding the best products for those distributors because the problem that they were seeing was that when they were bringing products into stores, the stores were able to get it cheaper by going to the, you know, national cash and carries or to big box warehouses like Costco, BJ's. So there was no way that they can compete with those margins. The only way that these distributors could survive was to bring exclusive lines that retailers couldn't get from those other uh, wholesalers in and service those accounts. And that's really where we came in. So we became the, uh, the product management arm for the independent distributors on a national level and since then, we've grown to about 960 distributors or jobbers around the country that are DSD, their direct store delivery. And we have about 200 wholesalers that we work for. Tell us about the business model of a distributor. And also, I'm interested to understand what you think the, the future of this business model is in, in the retail world. Yeah, no, that's a, that's a phenomenal question, you know, heavily debated. But the distributor is the person who takes bulk orders, pallet quantities of items, breaks them down and delivers them individually to the store. Are they taking, direct- are they actually purchasing that inventory with their own capital or is it on terms with the brand? Excellent question. It's all a little bit different, but I'll give you the breakdown on that. For the DSD jobbers. They purchase the product up front with their own capital, typically not on credit terms. They purchase it either on credit card or they do a bank wire, ACH, mm-hmm. and they pay for that product in bulk. Um, for the larger uh, or mid-sized distributors that have you know warehouses and many trucks on the road, they usually do a credit term of 30 to 60 days. Mm-hmm. And for you know the larger retailers that do their own fulfillment, you know, Walmart stretches it out 120 days. Yeah. So distributors take a lot of different forms. Mm-hmm. But the ones that we work with, the DSD jobbers, they do more than just the warehousing and delivery to the store. They do the in-store merchandising. And because they own that merchandise, they own the product with their own cash, they have the impetus uh, behind it to try to make it sell. So they put in the in-store marketing materials. They educate the store owners as much as they can to try to get the product to move off the shelf because that's the only way that they're going to get more money. Interesting. Okay. Yeah, that that makes a lot of sense. So you, the, the larger retailers and the one that comes to mind for me immediately is Whole Foods because they yeah. recently announced that they wanted all their vendors to be to pay a co-op fee for an, a single merchandising firm in Connecticut to do all the merchandising. So that that means like all the product displays and things like that would be handled by the one firm. And that's more of a situation that you see with big box big box retail or the national retailers and the smaller guys expect their distributors to do that for them. Somewhat, you know, and I bet that was the CMO's cousin. But uh, <laughs> yeah, it's really unclear as- what the relationship is because it it does seem kind of we're seeing Random. a lot of turmoil with uh, with Whole Foods with the Amazon takeover, and I spoke to a company yesterday, and they were working with Whole Foods from the beginning, yeah. I mean, from when they had five stores, I believe, wow. and now you know, they actually they got asked to leave, and they have to apply like everybody else. <gasps> no so, way! You know, wow. They're, there's not a lot of loyalty there, but you know that's the world of retail. It's not about you know that personal relationship anymore. It's about the numbers on the yeah. page. 
And to your original question, that's the change that we see on our level is that, you know, it's not it's not that handshake deal anymore. It's very much cutthroat. You know, Kroger right now, they, they've stopped any incoming products because they are reevaluating their entire process to try to compete with the Amazon, the Walmart, the delivery services that are in the world. So, so they're not, not buying anything new right now? They're, they're, right now, there's a current stop on all wow. new purchases. Board. And you know they're buying existing products, but you know, anything new coming in is uh, fully going on under a review process. Got it. So. so estimates vary, but a lot of analysts suggest that e-commerce only accounts for around ten percent of retail sales. And you know, with Amazon being the elephant in the room that it is, there's a lot of talk about this concept that retail is dying, like brick and mortar retail is dying. I imagine that you don't agree with that opinion. So tell us what you think is going to happen to brick and mortar retail in the next. Well, I do agree. I you think do? that it, there's going to be a consolidation. Right. So the, the idea that you're going to go to the, you know, you're going to go to Walmart and buy Pampers or you're going to go get your paper towels or your toilet paper, you, the sundry items that is, I, I feel that that is going to go away. Yeah. And the retail is going to take the form of being exclusive. So one thing that we do is we deal with the impulse items, the cash and carry, the, Mm -hmm. the places where you go to get, you know, a snack, the the impulse purchases, you know, we were the, we were behind the launch of five hour energy and five hour Mm -hmm. is an impulse purchase. You know, you're not going to go onto Amazon and purchase a single five hour energy for your, you know, road trip (laughs) when you have to drive three hours. So, we focus on that retail impulse purchase uh, area, and that is actually a growing area in retail. Mm. Over the last five to eight years, I believe it's been growing pretty steadily, and you know that's a different animal to the you know big box Walmart, Target. You know, I, I have to go there to get you know the same shirt because that's the only place to get it. So if you know what you want. I think Amazon online is the place to go. And that's where it's going to be moving. But if you don't know what you want, let's say, you know, have you, have you seen this, uh, all the people vaping? Vaping. Oh yeah. <laughs> okay. So a big, big, you know, craze vapor, you know, and th- we saw in our area, just a ton of these independent e-liquid stores opening and closing. Yeah. Um, you know, they were opened by a lot of you know, industrious people that really wanted to get into the industry because they saw the, you know, they saw the gold rush. But that's a perfect example of something that you can't buy online because you don't know what the flavors are. You don't know what you don't know. Mm. And the consultative sale, just like Ace Hardware is a very consultative sale. You know, mm. if you have a broken faucet, and you don't know what part you need, you know, you bring it into ACE and they're going to be able to help you out. Yeah. So that kind of a thing you know, can be done through forums and going online, but it's much more efficient just to bring it into your local store. Mm. Yep. That makes a lot of sense. So you're seeing consolidate, you know, to- Toys R Us going out of business, those kind of retail entities where you, you walk in and you're not really getting any services. There's no consultative, the associates are nowhere to be found, or if they are, they don't know anything. <laughs> and people generally have a better experience buying those products online. But like you said, the convenience items, walking into a bodega or a convenience store to get something that you need that day, that hour, even with services like Prime now, there's you know still... That's not every. That's not going to be everywhere. It's not going to be in, in every town and city, and it's right. not suitable for everything. It's kind of expensive. And then and there's you, also the, have to, you, know, yeah. you go into your coffee shop. You know, if you have an independent coffee shop that you go into every morning, every other morning, you know, they're going to also be selling you know nutri- nutrition bars. They're going to be selling yogurt. They're going to be selling gum. And, mints, you know, there's a number of different products that they offer besides the coffee. And so those little micro markets are going to be expanding and turning into, you know, you're going to go there for a destination item, but you also might pick up a couple other things. Right. Yeah. But not (laughs) even else. 
Okay, so you're in agreement that uh, around this consolidation. So in terms of what what you're seeing with brands moving into brick and mortar retail, what are some of the pitfalls that you've seen brands face when first approaching brick and mortar retailers for distribution? Yeah, excellent question. You know, the biggest thing that we see when they come from online Mm -hmm. is that they don't have enough margin built in for brick and mortar. So I'll I'll give you the bare bones breakdown, kind of what you should be accounting for when kind of making that move. So if, if I'm selling a pair of headphones and my pair of headphones cost me $5, that's my cost as a manufacturer. Mm-hmm. When I'm trying to set that retail price and set it for online, I might be comfortable setting it at $12 or $15, you know, because that'll make me a, a fairly decent profit. I'm okay with that. I have enough money in there for marketing and advertising. My cost of acquisition is 2 or $3. So, you know, That might be a good choice, but I'm not considering that if I want to go into retail in the future, that, you know, $15, $13 set of headphones isn't going to have enough meat on the bone when I'm talking to those retailers. Mm -hmm. So when we're talking about setting a price point, the retailers typically want between 30 to 50%. So they want, they're looking to get as close to double their money as possible. Now, when we're talking about food items, that, that cuts down to around 30. But you know, for the most part, they're looking to keystone their price. They're looking to double their money. And mm-hmm. if you have a product that has to go through a distributor, the distributors are looking for around 20 to 30%. So mm-hmm. you have to account for that as well. And right. if you're going to be using a broker or you know a middleman or somebody to get you into that relationship and to manage that, that's going to be about 5 to 10%, depending on what they're doing. So what's the difference between a distributor and a broker? It is a big difference. So a broker is an independent middle party that will make that initial introduction. They are typically working with either a distributor or a retailer already, and they agree for a commission to introduce your product to that relationship. Got it. Whereas the distributor is very much a warehouse delivery and in the case of DSD, a merchandising operation as well. So these distributors get so many inquiries from brands that they don't want to manage the negotiations themselves. And that's the role that a broker plays. Somewhat. I mean, you can't trust the manufacturer's numbers because (laughs) they're trying to sell, you know, and there's nothing wrong with that. But, you know, at the end of the day, you how can, how can you trust somebody that's trying to sell you, you know? So what, what, the biggest thing is for a broker is that they're the reliable source. They're somebody that the distributor can trust because they know that they're going to be able to back up those numbers. So Hmm. when you're, when you have a product that isn't in retail, the biggest thing is you have to get it tested out. You have to make sure that the product is going to move off the shelf without anybody there selling it. Because with online, typically it's a destination item. If I need a pair of headphones to use the example again, I'm going to go online. I'm going to say, what are the best headphones with a built-in microphone? You know, I'm going to find a blog or a recommendation. I'm going to purchase it on Amazon or whatever their website is. And it's going to be a destination item, Mm. right? Where if I go into a store, you know, I may be looking for headphones, but I only have a very, I have a very limited choice there. Mm. I don't have the recommendations. I don't have all of that. Mm -hmm. So it's, Really, how do you trust the person that's selling you that it is the best or it is a, it is going to move off the shelf? Right. So to get it tested on the shelf is going to be the best way to really grow your online presence and your retail presence. Got it. I've heard from some smaller brands that they prefer to deal with regional or independent retailers rather than the big box retailers. Mm-hmm. Why would that be? And like, when would you recommend a brand look at big box distribution or national distribution versus regional or independent? Yeah, going big box too fast is a quick way to die. Mm. You know, there's there's a lot that you need to know, and you need to have a lot of cash behind you. Yeah, just on the purchase order side alone, and you know, we 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 have a gr- lot of great resources that we've come across because of that need. Where a lot of uh, brands they don't 
account for how long it's going to take to get paid, how big the purchase orders can be, right. and what all the other associated fees are. So if if you decide to go with Walmart, you, you get a purchase order from Walmart, let's say they want to roll you out on a national level, right? You know, that might be a million dollar purchase order that you're going to have to fill, but you're not going to get paid on that for three, four months. And when you do get paid, it's going to be minus a lot of different, you know, stipulations yeah. in that contract with them. You know, you're, you're going to have to account for all the theft. You're going to have to account for returns. You're going to have to account for breakage plus their marketing fees. You know, mm-hmm. there, there's a lot of different stipulations in those agreements that squeeze that margin really down as tight as possible. Yeah. So, and then they keep re- renegotiating every year as well for a lower price. <laughs> very much so. You know, yeah. and you know, it's to the customer's benefit sometimes. But you know, at the end of the day, you really have to have that built in. You have to have your expectations managed when you're first setting your price, especially if you're an online mer- manufacturer. Yeah, that, I mean, it does make the online model even more attractive when you start talking about the the complexities and the the capital requirements. Before starting Bobsled, I was a commercial banker at J.P. Morgan Chase, and used to work with companies to secure credit and help them figure out what kind of you know credit facility they would need. And anytime yeah. it was a supplier to a Walmart or a vendor to Amazon, we'd be looking very carefully at that because they could be selling to to Walmart for years and then something happens and Walmart stops buying from them. And if that's what the majority of their business is built on, then yeah. there's that that just stops. If that just stops overnight, then you're really in a difficult place. But beyond that, it's just the capital. Like you said, you, you, you're yeah. working on 90, 120 day terms to get paid and all the shrinkage to, to deal with. At the with. end of the day, you may not be making any money. Mm. So yeah. it, by comparison, the regional and ind- independent retailers, do they have more favorable terms generally? Much yeah. Get into much more favorable terms. You can have that relationship. You can go in and do in-store demos. You can educate the people selling the product for you, the in-store clerks you know there's there's a lot of advantages to going local and regional first all of our distributors are either local or regional you know we don't work with any of the national distributors personally you know we, right. we refer product to them and we recommend product up when it's appropriate but you know that's very much a warehouse and delivery operation as opposed to when you're working with smaller local it's a lot more of that consultative sale and they're a lot more open to newer projects. Whole Foods was a perfect example of this. When yeah, we got I was just going to ask you about Whole Foods. Yeah. No, that, it's a perfect example. And, you know, to the customer I spoke to yesterday, to his credit, you know, he started on a very small local level with Whole Foods, got, you know, brought national. But to your point, he built all of his business on one elephant client. Yeah. And... Now he's struggling to find out what those next steps are to try to pad the elephant leaving the room. Mm, yeah, really challenging. And Whole Foods just seems to have changed so much. They used to have, even back when I was at JP Morgan, I know that they had their own credit facilities as well. They would actually finance smaller brands with lines of credit to help them scale up to a point where they could get distribution in Whole Foods. So. Yeah. I mean, very supportive of those smaller brands and willing to to try new things and well, experiment. They have an incubator, don't they? Yeah, that that's kind of yeah that that's kind of what it was. It was an incubator with financing options as well, mm-hmm. which can be a huge help for a small brand that's not otherwise credit worthy yeah, to a bank. Yeah. So now it seems to have changed a lot, and the the purchasing is now centralized. So you can't really. I'd, I'd heard anecdotal stories of people walking into Whole Foods stores and finding someone in the store and negotiating some space on the shelf, and that will just yeah, no, the, never uh, happen. The had purchasing power. Wow. And I think a lot of the time that's not understood by a lot of people is that the general manager of a store has the ability to purchase your product mm. if they're a local or regional you know, supplier. So if you're 
selling you know a food product or anything local and you go into your local grocery store that general manager typically has purchasing power now mm. they may say they don't if they don't like you or like your product <laughs> I mean, that's when you off. take it personally <laughs> typically they do have that purchasing power you know it may be on consignment it may be on credit terms but they do have the purchasing power to bring the product into their store mm. Right. Well, thank you so much for giving us the overview of selling to brick and mortar retail. And where can people find out more about Mr. Checkout and what other projects you have going on for, for brands? Of course. So in, Mr. Checkout is very visible online. We have a website, mrcheckout.net, M-R-C-H-E-C-K-O-U-T. You can find us on there and very much on social media as well. Great. Thank you, Joel, for coming on the show. Thank you so much. Well, thanks to both Curie and Joel for that interview. You know, Julie, one of the things that I took away from that, I loved his explanation of why he thinks that brick and mortar really isn't dying. It's evolving and it's consolidating. I found that part of the interview really interesting because his launch was behind the, or his company was behind the launch of Five Hour Energy, which is that huge brand that you see everywhere. So they've clearly been very successful with that. And it's, I mean, it's hard to find a grocery store or a drugstore or convenience store anywhere that doesn't have them in the cash register. And, and Joel has been focusing on this impulse purchase area, which is really growing. How retail really differs from other parts of retail, how that part differs and how he sees this as a harbinger of hope for the future of retail and how retail may not be dying after all. It may just be consolidating brick and mortar retail, but not really dying, you know? Well, and just a, maybe a specific category of retail is is dying mm-hmm. slowly with with it being CPG products that people will you know they're more scheduled in their purchase of it of things like paper towels and diapers and all of that and that's where he's seeing kind of the e-commerce market owning more than brick and mortar. Right. I also liked the point it wasn't just like the impulse purchase being a focus for the brick and mortar retail right now but also the idea of consultative sales or consultative. Yes. To, I, I think we can really vary on how we say that term. <laughs> but, <laughs> Made or tomato. Exactly. Yes. But you know what I'm referring to is really <laughs> the brick and mortar places like Lowe's and Ace Hardware, places where you need to go in and see the product and handle the product and talk to a sales representative to make sure that you're buying exactly what you mean to be buying. Mm-hmm. That is a very insightful point that makes a lot of sense as a consumer that makes a lot of sense when he surfaced that as a way that he, that brick and mortar is not dying that it's still has an important place in retail absolutely yeah yeah that's one place that e-commerce really can't play it just no matter what we try to do on a, on a product page you really can't play in that space no matter how hard you try yeah absolutely i thought that, that was a, a good point there what were some other points that jumped out at you I, you know, Whole Foods came up several times in this interview and the part towards the end where we talked about going local or regional first, I don't think I knew the story about how it used to be possible for a local seller of product to just go into a Whole Foods and convince a store manager to give up shelf space and how it could be sort of an incubator program for a product. And that actually that still happens at other stores today, which is, I think, really interesting to know for for small brands that might want to get short store shelf space and that actually store managers or regional managers actually do still have that power. And so going local or regional first is a great way to tackle a brick and mortar strategy to try and be omni-channel. And that, of course, Whole Foods having a new mothership doesn't really help in that regard anymore. They're much more centralized now and nationally distributed. But but there are other ways to tackle your local or regional market and thinking brick and mortar and thinking about how to get into that ecosystem is really, really important. And that's what Joel's company has specialized in since the early days when his dad started this model. Yeah, that I, that was an interesting point to me as well. I mean, it all boils down to you need to be strategic. You need to be going into any channel where you're going to sell your product, knowing all of the costs associated with it and and what's going to serve your brand and your product best. Mm-hmm. And he really did emphasize the point that like going big box too fast is a quick way to die. I think if we're going to pull out a catchphrase for this episode, yeah. it could be that. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. But he, the point is clear that when you go big box brick and mortar, there's a lot of hands in that pot that are tightening mm-hmm. your margins. And to really have a clear handle on all of that is is critical. 
And so going the local regional retailer first makes a lot of sense. Right. Absolutely. A more forgiving market, it seems. Yeah. And, and two, you can actually, you can dictate some of who sees, who is seeing your product first. And, and I think from a marketing perspective, we know too, that there's a lot of value in preaching your product being local. Yes. Right. And so being able to have that connection to the local customers in your community can actually be really powerful. So that's smart as well. Well, and the point too, that you have more as a, as the manufacturer, as the brand owner, you have more of an opportunity to do things like in-store demos and educate the people that will be in the store answering the questions of customers so that they can know more about your product. Yep. That is a point because you don't, in brick and mortar, you don't have you know all the previous customer reviews sitting there to help you make an informed decision. So to have That's someone right. in the store to help you make that informed decision and having a model that allows you as the manufacturer or brand to really leverage that, mm-hmm. that's not something to discount. That's a really legitimate point to pay attention to. Yes. But as we all know, customers will often go back to Amazon to check a product's reviews, even for an in-store item. So are you saying that it's really important that these brands also have an Amazon presence? (laughs) I think I am. Yes. I would would agree. I think I I support that assertion. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Great interview. Yes. This was a really interesting interview. So thanks to Joel for joining Kiri during their interview. And thanks to both Kiri and Joel for sharing such an interesting take on the brick and mortar space with all of us. All right. Well, thanks, Noel. And we'll see all of you back here next week with another episode of the e-commerce brain trust. Bye, everyone.